Thank you, everyone. Um, it's so exciting to be here sharing Carolee, thinking about Carolee. It really is a rare pleasure. Um, I think I can do a pretty smooth segue from um, parts of a body house that asks us to spend some time with cats into spending some time with cats. Um, <laughs> as you can see from my slide, um, which is really not that hard to do when we're talking about Carolee. Um, so I would like to talk and think about an interspecies love affair and the visions of the cat film that Carolee offers in her work. Carolee Schneemann's work really often involved cats, not just generic cats, but specific individuated ones, her beloved pets, her companion animals with whom she lived, traveled, and labored. To help untangle the significance of Schneemann's relationship, oh sorry, relationship with her cats, I call on philosopher Donna Haraway's posthumanist feminist work, which proposes a becoming with of companion species in nature cultures, cum panis, messmates, to look and to look back. And here you can see Carolee reading with her beloved Kitsch. I will address Carolee Schneemann's film works with her cats through this framework of companionship to examine how two wildly different ways of looking and perceiving are brought into contact, creating a fold in the flesh of the world as disparate ways of being converge into an affective site of meaning making, of becoming with, that raises question of coexistence and familiarity. In her book, When Species Meet, Donna Harway approaches Derrida's essay, The Animal That Therefore I Am, about the encounter between the philosopher and his cat, imagining the possibility of a different reaction to the gaze of the animal, by which Derrida was absolutely halted. She poses a question, what if work and play, and not just pity, open up, when the possibility of mutual response is taken seriously as an everyday practice. Today, I want to tease out the answer Carolee Schneemann provides to this challenge by focusing in particular on Infinity Kisses, the movie. This is for two reasons. Firstly, it was produced the same year as when Haraway book was published in 2008, and I therefore imagine it as a conversation between them. Secondly, it is a perhaps lesser known and seen piece of work, especially if compared to Autobiographical Trilogy, we've already talked about Fuses this morning, and it sheds a light on a different period of Schneemann's life, when the artist meets us as a mature woman, and I know we've mentioned her beautiful body several times, so that would be also quite interesting to think about. I find um, this film particularly impactful politically and philosophically, um, poking fun a little bit, perhaps, as Deleuze and Guattari, um, because they, in the Becoming Animal chapter of their seminal A Thousand Plateaus, scorn the bonds of love between old women and their pets, even stating anyone who loves a cat or a dog is a fool. That's... To their philosophy of the sublime, uh, Schneemann opposes a practice of the ordinary, of our favorite bit of Kitsch's Last Meal and Interior Scroll, uh, the personal clutter, the persistence of feeling, the hand-touched sensibility, which, again, used, she narrates in Kitsch's Last Meal, um, which is another fantastic portrait of the artist as a cat companion. And really, very much could be said on the topic of animal ethics uh, with regards to Kitsch's Last Meal and other films from Autobiographical Trilogy. But if I was to do so in this setting, I would probably be speaking to you for an hour. But if you would like to talk about cats later, do let me know. <laughs> Um, right now, I want to approach Haraway's question in light of a statement Carolee made during an interview with Alexander Juhas in 2001, to maintain this idea of dialogue between the two. Juhas asked about the legacy of Schneemann's work and what we owe her, to which Schneemann answered, you owe me bestiality, you owe me the love of the presence of the cat as a powerful companion and energy. You owe me heterosexual pleasure and the depiction of that pleasure. What a fabulous comeback. You owe me cats as companions, as familiars. And you owe me the representation of the pleasure of their company. I see three areas, then, in which Schneemann responds to our way animal ethics. For play, she answers with joy, share with her cats. For work, she offers her artistic endeavors and the study of sexual sacredness. And finally, through mutual response, she provides 
the creation of a filmic language for the representation of the radically heterosexual pleasure. Here, um, I mean the sense of love for all that is other than the self. I am going to address each of these aspects of Schneemann's practice as deeply intimate examples of post-humanist feminism, intended as the imbrication of animal and human life. Let's have a quick look at what the film is. Infinity Kisses, the movie, consists of two photographic series by the same title, arranged into a slideshow-style nine-minute film. It features two of Schneemann's cats, Vesper and Clooney the First, whom you can see on the slide, who were Schneemann's companions between 1981 and 1998. Originally created as 35mm photographs, the images show Schneemann being awakened from sleep by her cats and quickly immortalizing the moment with a snap of her camera, physically a selfie. The photos retain a spontaneous quality, and they are often out of focus or frame the subjects irregularly. I'm going to attempt uh, playing a brief clip um, so you can get a taste of the film um, for yourself, and I would love to sit with it um, just for a minute. I've been given instructions on how to do it. Um, so, as you can see, the images are daily variations of the artist in bed, tussle hair, and sleepy face, exchanging a morning kiss with her cat. And these are not chase pets on the forehead, but rather almost French kisses, uh, playing on an iconography or even performativity, perhaps, which makes them immediately recognizable to the audience as a passionate encounter. The figure of the woman, framed from the shoulders upwards, shares the space equally with that of the cat, so that albeit smaller, it comes to hold equal significance and visual power. The kiss is then the central encounter on the screen. The face of the cat is often fully visible, and their eyes are shut too. As Lynn Turner remarks, it would be recognizable as a portrait of a kiss, even if the title did not name kisses as such. The familiar is here both eccentrically and perhaps repulsively challenged but we can talk more about that in a moment. So having introduced the film, let's now look at the three aspects I have mentioned. I'm going to start, if I succeed, with play. Yes. So the film itself is a play on the romantic trope on the kiss between species, the princess kissing the frog. Only the cat does not transform into a man, but remains firmly itself. In fact, men are completely absent from this film, which is a big change from Autobiographical Trilogy. The cat seems almost to take up the mantle of Prince Charming's true love kiss. Vesper and Clooney awake Carol Lee by meeting her on her bed, like Sleeping Beauty, which also is very important because the artist was an older woman at this point. And I was thinking about that as I was sitting in the audience. The play on the trope continues in the setting of the film. The infinity kisses are exchanged in Schneemann's upstate New York home, where the hierarchy of affective relations is humorously, but seriously, subverted, positioning intraspecies monogamy as an alternative to heteronormative expectation and as a model for being with animals, all the while holding this disobedience in check through the quotidian tone of the work. The sense of deconstruction is furthered by the layer soundtrack, which you've heard, composed of blue cat purse, unsettling music, and the clicking of a camera shutter paired with breaking glass. This last noise is reminiscent for me of the shattering of a mirror. The major play on the mirror 
theme is the undeniable objectiveness of the images, the discomfort they might demand us to sit through for the nine minutes of the film, including perhaps the fear of bestiality. But in Schneemann's own words, the intimacy between cat and woman becomes a reflection of the viewer's own attitudes to self and nature, sexuality and control, the taboo and the sacred. She does not claim transgression, but instead, as Rebecca Schneider explains, lets her bestial documentation slip into the yawning profanity of the everyday. Women have historically been conflated with cats, and this is just another exploration of their closeness. Schneemann was always very clear about the powerful influence her cats have had on her. She wrote, they have instructed, oh, these are Vesper and Clooney, um, <laughs> They have instructed as to the transition between visible and invisible. They have clarified the motion between domestic words and a scale of landscape inaccessible to humans. They have enlarged <coughs> and shifted my scale of perceptions. They have clarified the presence and power of the paranormal and have expressed inspired, joyful devotion. This helps us to consider the second possibility of our relationship with animals, following Donna Haraway's proposition, work. And I love this screenshot from Kitch's Last Meal, in which Kitch, you can see, is hard at work on Carolee's desk. <laughs> Part of the equal relation that Schneemann establishes with her cats is an involvement in her artistic practice, not just as objects, but as co-creators. She has often spoken about the way in which the cat is her medium, is the point of view she adopts, for example, infuses, or is the catalyst of feelings, such as in Plum Line. She has gone so far as to cite the Grey Maltese Kitch, as the original creator of images that were then translated into her films. Schneemann also credited her cats with being feminists, for they gave intense attention to the details of life which traditional male culture isolates, denigrates, or despises. Infinity Kisses celebrates precisely such a despicable moment of intimacy, a show of affection between an aging woman, Carolee was almost 70 uh, when Infinity Kisses came out, and her beloved pet, it elevates this simple contact into an erotic exchange of political significance. Schneemann teases the boundary between morally invested taboos and arbitrary cultural constraints with an intraspecies kiss, which she calls a forbidden erotic kiss from a lost time. She is referring to the inspiration from Infinity Kisses, uh, which originated not only from her cat's spontaneous affections, but also from Schneemann's art history studies on ancient representations of the divine feminine, which we've mentioned today um, a few times. Schneemann had photographed um, an Egyptian relief of a lion bestowing a kiss onto a goddess, which you can see here, um, which according to the myth would restore peace to civilization. The photo of the fragment is included in the Infinity Kisses photographs and provides a key to the interpretation of the work while inscribing it into a longer tradition of feline and female collaborations. The original title of the fragment interprets the kiss as the exchange of the breath of life that the lion gives onto the woman. Schneemann reinterprets this myth and inscribes it into a domestic setting, following, as she has explained, her cat's lead to shift degrees of perception and examine the lingering presence of the paranormal, of the transcendental. So the coexistence of these disproportionate scales of meaning allows us to understand the significance not just of the figure of the cat, but of the specific individuated cats. Their function, as Schneemann writes, are seemingly contradictory ones between domestic and public activity. This revised sense of togetherness, both here and now in the home of the artist, and there in the mysterious depths of ancient history and legend, culminates in the kiss. Rewriting her own liberated sexual body, along with her radically subjectivized feline companions in the format of the ancient Egyptian relief, Shima revitalizes the symbology of the exact body in a contemporary context and provides a matriarchal and animal positive signification. The work of representing sexual pleasure is then imbricated with the acknowledgement of historical precedents of companionship, of jouissance, of poetic intimacy. So now we have seen both the possibility for play and work, and we have to come to mutual response, um, a request to which Schneemann positively responds. And again, from Kitsch's last meal, here is Kitsch 
looking right back at us, responding. Schneemann has said of Infinity Kisses that it raises question of intraspecies communication. Infinity Kisses mobilizes not only experimental visual language, but also another possible nonverbal dialogic strategy, that of touch. Haraway wrote of her dog, we have forbidden conversation. We have had oral intercourse. We are training each other in acts of communication we barely understand. We are, constitutively, companion species. Schneemann is engaged in precisely such a manner of sensual exchange. The photographs that make up Infinity Kisses are all tightly framed into a contact with the body of the artist and of the cat. We can clearly see the glittering of the saliva, the softness of the fur, the rampled sheets. These details relay the tactile intimacy of the renewed daily encounters, perhaps the ritual, and invite us to live in proximity with them, using our senses to make meaning of the facts represented. We are moved from the optic to the haptic, as Schneemann captures these moments without attempting to master them, respectful of the partial unknowability of the cat. The private ritual of interspecies contact and communication is specific to Schneemann and Clooney, or Vesper, so that the kisses become a signature touch, a polysemantic communication strategy. Embodied signifying acts can remedy the limitations of interspecies verbal communication, as the kiss becomes a gentler exploration of and by the central organs of speech that are not speaking. The feline-female boundary is crossed metonymically as lips substitute speech and physically by a probing of tongues. The breath of life that the lion bestows on the goddess can then be interpreted in the ability to speak in a new language, in a way that tugs at the limitations of communication the same way that Schneemann's film form challenges mainstream cinema's formal conventions. In When Our Lips Speak Together, philosopher Lucia Iregrai writes, how can I put, I love you, differently? And I believe Infinity Kisses is Schneemann's answer. Thank you. Thank you.